Hi class, uh, so my goal with this video is to just give you um, a better idea of how waveform diagrams in the time domain and spectrograms and power spectra in the frequency domain relate to each other. So basically looking at um, single vocalizations where you can see all three ways of looking at sound at the same time. And I'm gonna do that by giving you this demo on the software Raven. Uh, which uh, was developed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which supports a lot of different research into bioacoustics. And they're an ornithology lab, so most of that research is on birds, but, um, but they also support research on whales and insects and all sorts of cool critters. And it's partly to understand their communication and their behavior and their ecology, but a lot of that work is focused on conservation, using sound as a tool to study and help better protect wildlife. So, um, so let's just begin the demo with a very simple sound. So this is a 200 hertz pure tone. So two kilohertz pure tone. So this is about as simple a sound as you get. And so we'll start out up here with the waveform diagram and, um, and you can see that it's a pretty, it's different than most of the waveforms you've seen so far in class because this tone stays pretty constant in amplitude throughout the entire thing. And, um, and you can see this is the spectrogram down below and you can see what we're looking at here when I say it's a two kilohertz tone. So on the spectrogram here we have, um, on the Y axis we have the frequency in kilohertz and on the X axis we have the time. And you can see that this tone just remains constant across time with most of the energy right here at two kilohertz. There's a few other little bands where there's some energy, um, but that's just, uh, those are artifacts of the production of this, um, of this recording. It's actually really hard to make something that just has energy where you want it and no other energy anywhere else. But, uh, but most, the vast majority of the energy is right at two kilohertz. And so that's why this waveform just looks sort of like a constant bar across the top because the amplitude stays pretty steady throughout the whole time. Uh, but let's just zoom in on that. Let's start just focusing on, um, on the waveform up at the top. And if you zoom in on it, uh, you'll start seeing that it'll start looking more and more like a simple sine wave. And because this is a two kilohertz pure tone, it really does look an awful lot like a sine wave. It's not a perfect sine wave. Um, you can see little sort of bits and pieces that are a little bit different than a typical sine wave. And those actually are partly why we see these other little artifacts down below. Um, but it's mostly just a two kilohertz sine wave in this particular case. So we'll look at other sounds next that are much more complicated sounds. And when you zoom in on them, they don't look this simple. Um, but this is a very simple sound. So when you keep zooming out, whoops, sorry, other direction, keep zooming in, you'll at some point you'll start seeing these dots and these dots represent the sample. So this is a digital audio recording, which means that it takes samples over time and puts them together into a digital sound. Um, rather than making a continuous recording, it's just taking these digital samples. And so you could calculate the sample rate of this um, recording by looking at how frequently these occur over time. Most audio recordings are made at 44.1, which is, um, I think it's 44,000 hertz, um, so 44.1 kilohertz uh, audio recording. So, I mean, a recording rate. And so that's a lot of different samples per second. So in that case, the hertz refers to samples per second. Uh, and so anyway, these are a lot of different samples over time. And so you can interpolate between them and get this nice looking, um, mostly sine wave. Okay, so that's the waveform. Let's zoom back out. If you go out far enough, it just starts looking like a big solid bar because again, this is a, a constant tone. Okay, so now let's look at the spectrogram down below. We already, um, we already looked at this a bit. You can see it's just a pure tone with all the energy um, right at two kilohertz. And um, a spectrogram, we can think of it as a, it's a two dimensional image, right? It has, it has um, information on the y axis in kilohertz and the x axis in time, but there's actually a third dimension of information on a spectrogram, and that is amplitude information in the form of darkness. So amplitude is encoded as darkness. So it's a flat diagram, but there is a third dimension of information. 
um, which you could think of as sort of your Z axis, um, but it's, it's darkness here. And so um, you can see that all the darkness on this plot is at two kilohertz. And so that tells you that that's where the energy is. And um, down below, we have the power spectrum of that vocalization, and you can see how that's borne out. So the power spectrum down below represents the power spectrum directly under this magenta bar. So I'm just going to slide the magenta bar on along the spectrogram. And in this particular case, you'll see that the power spectrum doesn't change much when I do that. And that's because it's a continuous tone. It's not actually changing over time. In an actual animal vocalization, um, the power spectrum below would change as you slide this bar across. But there, our power spectrum below is just a time slice of the exact moment underneath this magenta bar. And so at that exact moment in time, and we, re we can remove time from our uh, diagram now because we're just looking at a single time slice. And instead, we're just going to focus on the relationship between frequency and amplitude, right? So amplitude on this diagram is shown as darkness and frequency as, um, um, as numbers along your y-axis. But now we're going to twist that and drop it down below into a power spectrum. So now we have kilohertz along the x-axis and amplitude is over time. And you can see that instead of darkness, now we have a, a line, a peak that represents amplitude. Okay, so if you sort of imagine, if you were to take this power spectrum and um, tip it on its end and put it up above right where the magenta line is, then this height of the peak would correspond to the darkness right there. Okay, so that's the relationship between those two plots. And so we see that the darkest part of the spectrogram is at 2 kilohertz, and down below we see that the tallest peak is right here over 2 kilohertz. All these other little peaks, those are just those tiny little artifacts that you can see up above in the spectrogram. Smaller lines that don't register that much. <coughs> Excuse me. And almost any, um, any recording you're going to see, there's always some noise in the background. In this particular case, the noise takes the form as these tiny little peaks. But the peak of interest is the one we see right here. Okay, so let's hear what that sounds like. It's just a simple, pure tone, okay? All right, so let's minimize that, and now we're going to look at an animal sound here. So this is the vocalization of a black-capped vireo, a type of bird. And, um, and now, again, we have uh, the waveform diagram up at the top, the spectrogram in the middle, and the power spectrum down below. <coughs> And uh, the waveform only allows you to get a little bit of information from this diagram. So you can see basically um, where the sound energy is in time and, um, and how loud it is, right? So for example, right here, you might measure the duration of this note from the waveform from the beginning to the end. And right here, you could see that the middle of these three notes is the loudest. So that's the kind of information you can get from the waveform. Um, you can also see, I guess I have to uh, shrink this down a little bit, but you can see right there that this note is the loudest part of this song. So it's the loudest out of all of them, right? So this is basically showing you deviation from ambient pressure. Um, and so it goes up and down around the zero line, which is ambient pressure. And so this one deviates the most. It has the highest amplitude. And so that's the loudest note of this vocalization. And if we slide this magenta bar around, then um, basically so we can line up between the power spectrum and um, the spectrogram and the waveform, if we put that right at that loudest part, we can see that we're talking about this note right there. That's the loudest note in the song. OK, so that's the waveform. Let's minimize that a little bit so we can focus on the spectrogram. And so, <coughs> excuse me, a little water there. Um, so let's start out with one of the simpler notes, this one right here in the middle. And so what you can see here is this is a single voiced sound, at least the majority of it right here, starting from right here and up to the end. It's a single voice sound. And what you can see here is um, this is the fundamental frequency. It starts low, goes high, gets a little low again, and then goes up at the end. 
And this right above it is its second harmonic. So it's a harmonic of that sound. And this is the third harmonic. So you can see that they all have the same basic pattern. They're traces of each other and they're multiples of each other. So if we look at where this cross is under the magenta line here, we can see um, you can actually read down below. So it's going to be right here. You'll see the frequency underneath the cursor as I point to things. So if we go up above here and I put the cursor right where that note crosses the purple line down below, you can see that the frequency is about 2287, right? So that's the frequency right underneath that fundamental, um, the, frequ the, the frequency of the fundamental frequency uh, sweep when it crosses underneath that magenta bar. And right up here, we see um, the second harmonic, which is a little bit louder in this case, and that should be at double the position of the fundamental which is at um, 4575, it's about double. I probably don't have the cursor in the exact right place. And this should be triple that. So this is the um, third harmonic and it should be triple that. And indeed it's somewhere around 6900. And so these are all multiples of that fundamental. So this is a harmonic series. And with a really simple harmonic series, if you were to take a tuning fork and hit it against the table, the fundamental frequency is the loudest, the second harmonic is a little quieter, third harmonic is a little bit quieter still, and then it drops in amplitude with each increasing harmonic. But what you can see on this bird song is that um, the bird has modified that fundamental sound that it was produced um, by oscillations in its um, vocal system, the syrinx, it's modified it. So now the loudest sound is actually in this second harmonic and they've filtered out some of the energy down here on the fundamental, so it's a little bit quieter than that second harmonic. And then the third is um, quieter still. <coughs> so that represents modification in the upper vocal tract um, by the organism as it's producing sound. Okay, so, um, so now we have uh, our magenta line, again, is representing where we are on the spectrogram. And now let's look down below at the power spectrum view. Okay, so um, where that first uh, fundamental frequency crossed the magenta line, again, was about so it's 2250 right here. And if we look down below at the power spectrum, that's exactly what we see, right? So that peak right there is it about 2250, somewhere right in there, right? <coughs> the top of that peak corresponds to what we see underneath here on the spectrogram, right? So that's the first peak. The second peak is right here, okay? And then the third peak is right here, okay? So you can see the number appears up here as I point to each of those peaks. So you can see where those two points correspond between the power spectrum and the spectrogram, right? So if all you were given was this spectrogram view, you could use the information on that spectrogram and draw a ballpark estimate of what the power spectrum would look like. You can't make a perfect power spectrum with only a spectrogram to draw from because the only information you have about amplitude is encoded as darkness, right? So all you know is that this peak is the highest, this peak's a little lower than that, and this one's probably even a little lower. Um, the top and the bottom may be pretty similar in amplitude. That's really all you can tell. But the other thing you can tell, besides their relative amplitude, is their location in terms of frequency. And so you could draw a ballpark um, spectrogram down below. You wouldn't be able to put numbers on this y-axis, right? So you could just leave that blank and just note that it's in decibels, but you don't put any numbers to it because you don't know how loud those are. And you would draw one peak that's at the location of that first one, which is um, two, two something, right? You draw a second peak up here at four, six something. <coughs> and then the third one you would draw up here um, closer to seven. And so you can read that off of the spectrogram and translate it down into a power spectrum below. Okay, does that make sense? So you can't draw a perfect power spectrum when you only have a spectrogram to work with, but you can get pretty decent ballpark of the shape of the power spectrum. And so that's the assignment on your homework, and you might get something like that on the exam.
Because to draw this diagram, you really need to understand the relationship between these different types of figures. And so that's why I'm having you do this. So let's look at one of the other fairly simple notes in this vocalization, which is over here. And so this is also a harmonic series. This is the fundamental frequency down below. This is the second harmonic, and that's the third. And just like the last note we looked at, um, the second harmonic is actually the loudest, and the bird has filtered out some of the energy um, down in the fundamental, and it's filtered the third harmonic down even lower. But once again, you can see this first peak crosses right here. Um, which is 2.3 kilohertz, and that's where we see the peak down below on the power spectrum. And then the second one crosses right here. It should be around 4.6, um, something like that, depending on exactly where you hold the cursor. Um, but that's right here, and that's the second peak you can see on the power spectrum. And the third peak is actually so quiet that it hardly registers over the background noise, but it's right here. Okay, so again, all you know from the spectrogram is the relative height of these things and about where they're located on the x-axis, um, but you can't really say anything about the actual numbers that are going to go here in terms of decibels um, if you were only given the um, spectrogram to draw from. So let's look briefly at some of these other notes here. There's some really interesting notes. This is a very complex song. And so this note right here it may look at first pass, it may look like a series of harmonics, just like the other. But if you look closely at it, you see that these are not evenly spaced. So um, these are not multiples of each other, and they actually have a slightly different shape, right? So this one's sort of a flat S. <coughs> Excuse me. And this one is shaped more like a check mark. And so these are two different notes. So this is a songbird, and this is a two voiced sound. excuse me. Uh, and so this is one of the notes right here. That's the fundamental frequency. It's very quiet. It's been filtered out. And this is the second harmonic of that fundamental right there. And the third would be somewhere up here. You could hardly even see it. It's been filtered down so much. <coughs> but it would be a multiple of those other two. So it's maybe, maybe it's this thing right here. Whereas this check mark shaped one right here that's the fundamental, and it's the loudest in this case. This is the second harmonic. It's a little bit quieter, and that's the third harmonic up there. So you have two independent sounds that are being produced with the two sides of the vocal tract of the bird, the two parts of the syrinx, the two sound sources in the syrinx, are doing different things. They're producing different shaped frequency sweeps. And so when you listen to this, it sounds very different. Um, let's listen to it in regular speed first. So that was the whole vocalization. Let's listen to just what's in that red box. Okay, so that's at regular time. It's really hard to hear what's going on. So let's slow that down. Um, so now we're only going at um, 0.2 the speed here. <coughs> so 20% regular speed. And now let's hear what that sounds like. So you can hear there's this sort of ethereal sound that sounds like two different sounds at once. Let's hear that again. And now let's compare that to this note right here, which was just a single harmonic series. So there's only one voice happening at once. <laughs> That's... Um, sounds sort of owl-like, doesn't it? Uh, but that's just a single tone. And we can look, listen to this one. This was also a single tone, right? <laughs> it sounds like sort of a whine that just changes in frequency over time. Whereas that two-voice sound just has that really ethereal sound of two different voices at the same time. And this is another two-voice sound right here. There's all sorts of crazy stuff going on in this one. So again, it sounds like that, that ethereal sound. This note is really interesting. So there's an up sweep right here and a down sweep right there. And these this is a two voice sound. Um, you can tell because these overlap in time. You can't do that with a single sound source, right? So there's, there's um, this note's going up, that's its second harmonic, and that's its third. And then this note's going down, um, and then their harmonics are up above. They get a little bit mushy up in there, um, but the, the harmonics would be up in here. <coughs> So let's listen to the first part of that note before the second voice kicks in. It sounds like this. It just sounds like that sort of whine that's increasing over time. And now let's listen to the second part. 
where the second voice kicks in. Now it's got that ethereal tone to it. So if we wanted to listen to the whole thing, it sounds like this. All right, so it begins with a single voice and it adds the second one in. So let's listen to the entire thing again now in slow. And you can really hear how complex these um, vocalizations are. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you is, um, is a recording of the human voice. Or So you can see the waveform up above, spectrogram in the middle, and the power spectrum down below as I'm talking. And I want to do this because I just want you to see how incredibly complex and cool the human voice is when you look at it in a spectrogram. So across the top here with the waveform image, you're probably familiar with that if you've done any digital recording, um, even on your phone or on your computer, you're probably used to seeing this, right? It's just, it just shows you how amplitude changes over time and it allows you to make sure you've got your settings correct and you're actually capturing something. And when you just look at that waveform up at the top, it doesn't even look that different than the bird song we were just looking at. But when you look at the spectrogram, it's just a totally different thing. So the human voice is really complicated. We only have a single oscillating source of sound in our vocal cords. And so you're seeing lots of harmonic stacks here. Um, and you can see that I'm changing the frequency, right? So I can go up and down and up and down. Um, you're, you're seeing it come in on the side there. So that sort of real time is happening right on the side. So you can see me going up in frequency and then going down in frequency, right? So that's me changing the fundamental and you can see the harmonics change along with it. But the amazing thing about the human voice is all the other stuff that's happening here. Uh, and so I just want to point a few of those things out. So first, let me just start out by doing some vowel sounds. Um, so let's begin with A, E, I, O, U. All right, so those are the vowel sounds. And vowel sounds are unique. Um, because that's when we have basically our throat is wide open and um, or our mouth is wide open and it's just the oscillations of our vocal cords that we're seeing and they all have slightly different um, uh, energy distribution across that harmonic stack um, and that's just because of the way that we're holding our mouth right when we do the different vowels we're just changing the position of our mouth. We're emphasizing different aspects and others. And this is part of what's amazing about the human voice is that by moving our mouths around, we can, we can really emphasize certain frequencies and de-emphasize others. Um, and that's how we take those simple oscillations, which are all fairly similar in their fundamental frequency, and make them sound like the different vowel sounds. But when you look at these vowel sounds, you can really just see that this is a harmonic stack, right? So it's not that different than the bird song we were looking at. It's just at a much lower fundamental. And so remember that the harmonics are all multiples of the fundamental. So in this case, the fundamental is at only at 136 hertz. And so each one of these is a multiple of that. So there's lots and lots of different harmonics here. Whereas if your fundamental is way up here at three kilohertz, then you're not gonna get your second harmonic till up at six, right? So we just have lots and lots of different harmonics because we have a very low fundamental. Uh, but let's, let's look at the power spectrum here. So if we slide the bar across here, and let's see, we're looking at this is A, E, I, O. So this is O right here. Um, and you can see that right there, that is the fundamental frequency. And if you look down here on the power spectrum, that peak right there is that fundamental frequency, right? It looks like, um, based on what we're reading down below, it's somewhere around 180 uh, hertz, right? And then the second harmonic is right here. Um, that's at 366. Uh, and this one right here is at 540. So again, these are all approximately multiples of each other. Um, and the variation off that perfect multiple is really just exactly where I'm holding the cursor. Uh, but you can see all of those different peaks of the harmonics are down below, just like we saw in the last plot. It's just that there's a lot more peaks in the human voice because there's just so much more harmonic energy.
Okay, there we go. So some of the other sounds that we make in the human voice, you can see that there's a lot of energy way up here. And those are the different kinds of sounds that we make, um, like the sound P, right? So the letter P or B, these are what are called plosive sounds. It's sort of like you're exploding a bunch of energy out of your mouth when you make it, and it makes that P sound. And so you can see that's a really broad band sound. That's not a sound that's made with our vocal cords. That's a sound that's made um, with our lips. We're pushing sound out of our mouth and make a P sound, right? Our vocal cords are not involved. And so you get energy all the way across the different frequencies. In many cases, um, when I'm not exaggerating it, it's mostly up in the higher registers. So that's the P sound. That's one of the sounds that we use a, as well as um, the sounds from our vocal cords in order to produce human speech. But there's also the letter S, right? So the letter S is made by, um, basically it's kind of a whistle in the front of your mouth, right? You're pushing air um, at, the, at the front of your mouth. And so you can see that it actually looks kind of similar to the P sound. It's that um, rapid, you know, it's, well, it's not as rapid onset, but it's a very broad band sound with energy across lots of frequencies. But with the letter S, it's mostly, most of that energy is up fairly high, right? But the letter F, F is kind of similar, right? It's also a very broad band sound, but you can see the energy distribution is different from F and S. And that just has to do with exactly where we're making that kind of whistling sound. Um, so those are just some examples of the kinds of sounds that we add to that um, harmonic series that we get from our vocal cords in order to produce human speech. And so we add a lot to that very simple sound. And we can also uh, do a lot changing that simple sound. So, um, so we can really change the sound of that pure tone coming from our vocal cords. And so I have a cold right now, and so my voice is low and scratchy, uh, and so it doesn't look all that clean. But if I very much try to emphasize the sounds that I'm making, then it looks a little bit cleaner on the spectrogram. Whereas if I just sound, you know, I really emphasize the fact that I sound very sick and um, let my voice be scratchy, then you can see that things just kind of get much more chaotic there and it's harder to see those frequency bands. Um, things get very blurred together, right? So you can see the differences between the sort of emphasis on the harmonics and um, just letting your voice get scratchy. And this sound that I'm making right now, actually letting my voice get scratchy, is known as vocal fry. And lots of people use this to different effects. Like if you were a teenager and you're trying to piss off your parents, you may say, whatever, mom. And, um, and there you go. That's what whatever mom looks like. And so I'm using vocal fry. And, um, and that's what that looks like on the power spectrum and the spectrogram. And so anyway, those are the different things that, um, that you can do in the human voice and things that characterize mammalian sounds um, and make them very, very different than most bird sounds. There are some bird sounds that look fairly similar to this. If you just look at the spectrogram, like parrots and penguins and other things that that make uh, much more complicated, scratchy sounds like us. Um, but they look very, very different than bird song, for example. Okay, well, hopefully this helped you understand the relationship between these different ways of visualizing sound. And if you have any other questions, then, um, then be sure to let me or the TAs know. But otherwise, hopefully you are ready to be able to draw a power spectrum sort of rough power spectrum based on a spectrogram image that you might get on, for example, an exam or the homework. Okay, good luck.